This is Duke University. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Duke Idea Boston event. We are so delighted to have well over 200 strong here this evening, and we're looking forward to a great evening. My name is Sterling Wilder, and I'm a member of the class of 1983, and I'm the director of alumni affairs. Thank you. Some 83s. They're tired of celebrating 83 at Duke. I was at our reunion last year. Can't do more. But we want to thank our um, thank you all for being here, but also thank our great volunteers for the Duke Club of Boston um, for their help this evening as well. So thank you. We're really thrilled to be here in Boston, even though it is very cold for people that live in Durham, I have to say that. But we're especially delighted to have this evening uh, President Richard Broadhead and Blair Shepard, who is Dean of Duke's Fuqua School of Business. And we're also pleased that Mrs. Broadhead could be here with us this evening, as well as Dean Tom Katsileas from the Pratt School of Engineering, Richard Riddell, Vice President, University Secretary, is he in here? That good back in the room. Just teach you all to be here. Mike Schoenfeld, class of '84, vice president for public affairs um, and government relations. I've not said that completely yet. That's good. And Bob Shepard, vice president for alumni affairs and development. And there's several other staff members in the audience, and I hope you'll have a chance to meet them as well. So tonight. Again, we're debuting this new program for Duke, the Duke Idea, and hopefully you've seen all the signs around and noticed it on, your, on the em emails and information that you received. And the purpose of this is to bring the intellectual excitement of Duke directly to you, our alumni and parents. And we want you to hear firsthand from deans and faculty members about the new and innovative programs which they are working on and their numerous successes. Given that it's difficult, if not impossible, <laughs> to read the paper or turn on the TV without hearing more disturbing, more disturbing news about the financial crisis that has gripped the nation and the world, we thought the topic of our inaugural Duke event, Duke Idea event, should focus on the global economy. Duke is proud to be home of one of the premier business schools in the country, recently ranked number eight, is that right? If you look at polls, and on its way up, and at the helm of the Fuqua School of Business is a man who has a clear vision for the future of the school and the needs of its students. Dean Blair Shepard recognizes that Fuqua must build leaders of consequence for a global economy. But you can't do that with a standard business school model. As a result, Fuqua recently announced its multinational expansion plan that will create the first truly global business school shaped and driven by the fundamental issues of our time. Tonight you will hear a conversation between President Broadhead and Dean Shepard one that I can assure you has taken place numerous times before in a setting much like the one you will see tonight. From their conversation, we hope you will gain insight into Fuqua's global expansion and how those plans fit into Duke's greater international ambitions for the 21st century. I suspect you'll have comments for both of our speakers, uh, and we hope, and there will be time for that at the end of the program. Also, a couple of other uh, uh, notes. Please turn off your Blackberries and cell phones because it interacts with the microphones. And we were in uh, Orange County, California last Thursday night, and truly, it sounds like fingers going down a blackboard when it squeaks. So please turn them off, and you can't even mute them. You really need to turn them off. And there's no cell service in this room anyway, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. Also, at the end of the evening, we have organic uh, cotton t-shirts for you to take home. Please do not wear those without a coat tonight on your way out that say Duke Idea. Also, we will be, um, the, the food and beverages will be again out at the end and we hope that you will enjoy those and stay and enjoy good conversation. And lastly, Stephen sitting at the top of the stairs will validate your parking ticket on the way out. So those are the programming notes. And before I turn the program over to President Broadhead, I always have to say a few things about the Alumni Association. I'll be very brief, I promise. Um, as you know, or may not know, we have over 5,000 alumni and parents who are, live in the Boston area. And so that is a huge um, group for us, for Duke, and it's very important. And your, your participation tonight and your engagement with Duke, however you do it, is also vitally important. Many of you here tonight are reunion volunteers and will be coming back to campus in April. If you're an undergraduate celebrating in fours and nine, I know you've had a, had a little pre-event beforehand. Several of you interview students. Many of you watch basketball games. Many of you now watch football games. Hopefully you all read the Duke Magazine. 
Hopefully you all read the Duke Magazine. You come to campus, you serve on boards, you go to events in your local area, you talk about Duke with your friends. All those points of engagement are really important. And at the Alumni Association, we have a lot of jobs we think we have to get done, but a couple of them that I want to talk to you about tonight or let you know is it is our job to engage you with Duke. No matter how you want to do it, we want you to be engaged for a lifetime. And whether it's a full-blown engagement right now or just a little one, being engaged is important. So that's one. Two, we want to develop programs that will be exciting for you to be part of. Tonight we have people that I, we've never seen at events and people we've seen at lots of events. But that's really important. And thirdly, it's also really important to enjoy your engagement with Duke. To enjoy it, but also to get meaning out of it and to be able to share that with others. So that's my plug. It is over. It is now, so let us know what else we can do to ever help you. That's the final plug. So now it's my honor to introduce President Broadhead this evening. And he is a, a, obviously a very special guest to have in Boston. And since becoming Duke's ninth president in 2004, President Broadhead has ushered in a new era of expansion, investment, and altruism at Duke. From the creation of the Duke Global Health Institute and the success of our financial aid initiative to the launch of our civic service program, Duke Engage, President Broadhead has been a true leader for our university. And it is my pleasure to turn the podium over to him for an update on Duke and then to welcome Blair Shepard. Thanks for coming. Go Duke. I must say it is just a huge pleasure to be back in Boston. Uh, Durham is a fabulous place to live, but I lived 40 years of my life in New England. Uh, I, you know, I only wore my winter coat four days last year. Uh, <laughs> but there was a nostalgic pleasure in getting it out again and coming up here. Uh, and I must say, whenever I come, I mean, it's such a wonderful part of the country, uh, but whenever I come, the Duke crowds in Boston are also just particularly great. Uh, many of you, I think, spent the evening with me at the Museum of Fine Art about 18 months ago, and then uh, I just want to also uh, compliment the people who find these venues. Uh, I probably walked down the street, but who knew this place was here? Uh, and if you come back tomorrow, it probably won't be. <laughs> because you may or may not know that this is a cunning simulation of my office. I did, I did not know. It, it's, like, it's like a Bostonian version of my office. Uh, here's what is true. The window is historically correct, and I have two chairs quite similar to this. The building outside the window is at Duke, though not outside my window. <laughs> the picture, I'm sure, was made by Paul Revere and pinched for this occasion. <laughs> and the paintings are very nice, and I would be happy to take them home with me. Uh, you have heard the, the format I'm going to talk about, just to give a quick update about Duke for uh, 10 or 12 minutes, and then I'm going to ask my great colleague and friend Blair Shepard to come up uh, and be interviewed, and it is true that he and I have sat in these chairs, uh, and although I knew you pretty well, I interviewed you for your current job in just such chairs. Uh, so now I will do it all over again, except this time in public. <laughs> Uh, this has, I guess you don't need me to tell you, this has been an extraordinarily tumultuous time in the world we share. Uh, and I know that everybody here has been riding those currents uh, uh, in their own uh, complicated ways. Uh, and I just want to say, while Duke is in the world and subject to all the forces uh, that are currently making the world a place of such uncertainty, it is also true that this has been a particularly fabulous fall on the Duke campus. Uh, at the end of every week, I think, how could we outdo that? And then at the end of the next week, you say, that's how we could do outdo that. So I would just mention a few things uh, that have taken place within the last 10 days, right? Today's like Wednesday? Okay, within the last 10 days. A week ago Friday, we announced that we had reached our goal of raising $300 million for endowment support for financial aid. We set, we set that target three years ago, and with the help of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of donors, we reached the goal. We announced reaching it. I, I, I'm sending a letter to everybody who made a contribution, but we announced it at a gathering of students because, after all, everyone who gave money gave it for the sake of our students. 
Uh, I said on that occasion, and I think students stopped to reflect on it, I said to them, education is the most valuable gift that can be given or received. Uh, you know, lux every luxury vanishes, uh, except education is the thing that added to your powers enables you to fulfill your promise in the world. And I said something else that had never really occurred to me before, which is all those years people were giving us gifts for financial aid, they could have been, as they say, investing that money. Okay, now instead of investing it, they gave it to us for financial aid. Or to put it more correctly, instead of investing it where moths do corrupt, they I invested it in the human capital of our current and future students uh, because those uh, uh, endowment funds will be opening the doors of education for students from now until the end of time. Uh, so if that were the only thing that happened this fall, I would consider this a pretty good fall. However, I left that event in haste to change my clothes because I had to show up at the Nasher Museum uh, uh, to the tragic farewell, uh, bid a tragic farewell to the El Greco to Velazquez exhibit. You guys had that in Boston, yeah, yes. But you know, you have lots of great exhibits in Boston. But the only other place that exhibit was ever shown in the world beside Boston was in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, and how fun do you suppose it was for me as I left home to be able to pop in and visit my favorite El Greco for a few minutes? Uh, we had uh, 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 tens of thousands of people. We had student events. It's just uh, amazing to think that the place that used to be a field of weeds that opened three short years ago as a museum now became the place that housed that exhibit this fall. And how fun was it on the very same day we reached the goal of the financial aid initiative for the government of Spain to send someone to bestow a knighthood on our colleague, the curator, Sarah Schroff. <laughs> oh, that's nice, you say. That's what I say. <laughs> she is now entitled to call herself Su Illustrissima uh, and is a knight commandant of the order of Queen Isabella of the Catholics for promoting appreciation of Spanish culture in the New World. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, there's another thing we do on weekends these days in the fall, Sterling alluded to it, which is Duke has a large football stadium, and we have always had a football team, but there has never been a very sizable crowd of Dukies at the football game. I want to tell you what may be the single most amazing thing that has happened at Duke this fall is that walking from my house to the NC State game, I ran into a scalper trying to sell a ticket. <laughs> he tried to sell me a ticket for $40 to the Duke NC State game. We did not win that game, but we have won four games this fall, and we've almost won two. But I want to tell you, yeah, well, hold it a second. Duke has only won four games in the first four years of my presidency of Duke. <laughs> and it has only won about 40 in the last 40 years. Uh, so the thing that is so amazing is that when we hired David Cutcliffe last year, he did not throw out our players and bring in new ones. He will bring in fabulous recruits. He took our very same players who've been out there every Saturday all these years, and he worked with them so they could go out and win these games instead of losing them, and so that we could fill that stadium. We had 31,000 people in there a week ago Saturday. Uh, this is a new reality at Duke. Uh, and I just want to say, if any, you know, people sometimes uh, say to me, why did you not grow up? Why did you never leave a university? Uh, I don't understand why anyone ever voluntarily left a, you know, where else do you have, uh, you know, uh, financial aid campaigns and art museums and football teams, all just part of this sort of seamless web of everyday life. It has also been a fun fall in that we've invited a lot of very smart people to campus to talk about subjects of deep interest of, uh, to every citizen of the modern world. And we've made the condition in these invitations that the person has to not just come and give a celebrity appearance in a lecture, but come and meet with students all day uh, and often all night. Uh, uh, the week uh, after Tom Friedman's new book on energy and the environment came out, 
he came to Duke as one of his first appearances. He met with students in our engineering school, our environment school, our public policy school, and pretty much everybody. Uh, that man, who you recently read in The New Yorker, and correctly, is indefatigable, was fatigued at the end <laughs> of the day. But not because he lacked stamina, but because he was subject to the relentless experience of the intelligence of our students and colleagues, which is what's so fun in a university. Uh, I was just talking to uh, someone I didn't get to say hello to at the event where we dedicated the new law school building uh, the other day, the new library and the new, com the new commons. Architecturally, it's magnificent. All the light is thrown open. And now you can see that the law school is part of a whole that contains Duke Chapel, the business school, public policy. They're all visually present now to the law school. Uh, and to dedicate that building, we issued an invitation to Anthony Kennedy who came and gave one of the really profound meditations I have ever heard. Well, Winston, you were there. Uh, just simple, off the cuff, but utterly profound meditation on what law is and where it came from and what it means to have it and what it would mean to lack it. I wanted him to go to the football game with me. I would have bought him a ticket for $40. <laughs> However, he was staying to talk to students in the law school, which he did until some time of that afternoon, uh, pretty late in that afternoon as well. Uh, this, uh, I had last winter met Michelle Rhee, who you may know because she's just been featured in the uh, Times and Wall Street Journal. She is the 37-year-old woman who was hired to be the commissioner of public education in Washington, D.C. Uh, she's a person, she went to college, her parents wanted her to be a doctor, instead she became a teacher, and now at the age of 36, she became the head of the school system in our nation's capital in which 8% of the children read and perform at grade level. Uh, so she came to talk about the issue of education, challenges, reform, disparities, all of those things, uh, and again, I don't know, we had dinner with her on Sunday. She'd already been meeting with students all afternoon, and the next day she met with five, stu five classes of students and with uh, Durham public school teachers and superintendents. It was just a great event. So I'm gonna say, you know, what makes a university fun is whatever you go there to do, there are a million collateral activities and, the, and they're just all stitched together in ways that are very hard to program in advance, uh, but that do lend an air of continual excitement to the place. Never a dull moment at Camp Duke. This fall, Duke, like everywhere else in the world, you know, has uh, been looking at a world uh, uh, economically very different from the lovely one we have uh, grown somewhat used to inhabiting uh, and full of uncertainty. But I want to say even there, and I did send you a letter, which I know you all read, uh, explaining this, uh, given, given the possibilities, Duke is at the moment quite well positioned. Uh, our endowment is down between the 1st of July and now. Uh, someone told me they heard it was down 50%. Uh, that's off by a, a gigundo factor. Uh, it's, it's off some, not nearly as much as many that I've heard about, uh, but it had gone up 26% two years ago. So, you know, the truth is, when I became president of Duke, the endowment was about $3 billion, and last year before all this, it was about $7 billion. So we're better off, uh, we're, we're better positioned to ride this out. Aren't we happy we raised $300 million for financial aid before a lot of people's parents became unemployed rather than trying to start raising it tomorrow when it would have probably been a fair bit more difficult? We will manage the resources of the university prudently at this time. We won't act beyond our, the level of our certainty. We're not starting giant uh, multi-billion dollar projects without understanding uh, what the consequences will be in out years. But at the same time, I want to say to you, and I know you know this, which is whatever people can say about the American economy, if you want to know a sector of the American economy that remains an absolute world leader, it still is higher education. I've traveled internationally extensively recently. Uh, people don't come up to you and say, our universities are about to pass your universities. They say, how do you do it in your universities? Our universities are the engines of innovation, the engines of discovery in biomedical research and all the other things that have driven our economy. And better yet, our universities are the places that train smart, tough people who like a challenge and use their intelligence on it. And you know, if our world needs such people, well then let's be happy we have universities to turn them out. 
And the second thing I'd want to say before I get to Blair, who must be wondering why I don't cease my brief remarks. <laughs> the second thing I'd say is this. Uh, it is not my intention, as president of Duke, uh, to treat this as the beginning of an ice age in the university. If we have to live on uh, a tighter, or with our belts pulled in a little bit from last few years, we can learn how to do that. Uh, but uh, it is not my idea to stun the organism into a recoil or to freeze the status quo, which has sometimes happened in the history of modern universities during recessions. Uh, this is a time when the nature of the world is changing and the nature of education needs to track and lead those changes. And so Duke needs to keep advancing, not in excess of our means, but we certainly need to keep in mind our mission and make this a time when we advance toward it too. I'll just say very quickly, and I'll uh, say, say, uh, speak at more length if you, if you want to know later on, education needs to evolve at least three ways, uh, and Duke is extraordinarily well positioned to lead this evolution. The old model of education is based on specialization. You majored in history and not philosophy, or biology and not chemistry, and then you went to business school and not law school. Uh, but in the world we live in, knowing one skill is not enough to solve any interesting problem. I just went to India with Blair a couple weeks ago. India is famous for its engineering schools, but everyone in, in India wanted to talk to me about our master's degree in engineering management, where students learn engineering and how to make up a business plan and test out a venture, and they take intellectual property courses in the law school. That kind of range of abilities helps somebody do something with engineering they can't do with engineering alone. When I was in India, I talked to people who are in the process of trying to evolve a system of public health education in that country with its giant public health needs. And of course, I was delighted to discover they were having Mike Merson come as a consultant, he being the head of the Duke Global Health Institute, the point of which is we don't have as many resources as some health schools and public institutes do, but we are the one that has put together lawyers and business people and medical researchers and engineers and ethicists and all those different skills, uh, and that's something we have to offer in that score. The world of the future needs to train people to put skills together rather than to divide them from one another. The world of the future needs to train people to deal not just with people like them and their families, but with all different kinds of people who share common problems but think about them from different positions and uh, with different axioms and uh, implications. And so we need to prepare our students for that kind of much more mobile and global world. And above all, we need to educate our students not to be passive recipients of knowledge, but to be agents from the first day of their education, because education never did anyone any good unless there's somebody inside you taking that education and putting it to unexpected uses in the course of their long life. I'll tell you two quick stories about this. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It occurred to me coming here today, when I met with you guys at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, that was the first public announcement of the program called Duke Engage, in which Duke has told undergraduates, if you will find a place in the world where you can take academic knowledge out into a place in this country or the world and help be part of the solution to a health problem, education, environment, whatever, we will fund you to do that. That summer, we had 90 students at Duke's expense. Last summer, we had 360 students in the world getting that kind of education. That's an amazing program to have in place. Uh, in the second row, I see the Dean of Engineering. Uh, you know, Duke is a university. My first week as president, an engineering student came and said, we, we, we all think we could design better systems than any we see available commercially in the world. How about if we build a house where we would design everything in it? Okay, so what is a university president supposed to say? Like, how about no? <laughs> uh, Duke instead, it's really quite, you know, you know Duke the way you know that Duke did not blow these students off, right? I mean, really, if you don't know how to blow students off, you are not an administrator. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Duke worked with these students, it found partners, it found sponsors. Sure enough, when you go to that house, people take you, oh, would you like to see my hot water system? Would you like to see how the drain of my shower recaptures all the heat so that we don't have to spend extra fuel uh, to uh, heat new water for the next, for the next shower? Uh, uh, 
you know, this is a place where students not only took the classes, but used their imagination, and, and now they dwell in a house that is an extension of their ingenuity. That's literally true. And it was designated this summer, uh, you know, the LEADS system of environmental certification. The smart home at Duke was the first uh, uh, school residence on planet Earth to be designated at the platinum level. I'll just tell you one other, which is I was visited, these are true stories. They are. I was, I was visited about three weeks ago by three students who had spent the summer in Vietnam. Well, in my time when you spent the summer in Vietnam, it had a different meaning. Uh, they had, one of them had had an internship in Vietnam, and she wanted to go back and teach English and science and help put, give people a foundation so they might aspire to college education later on. She created a program entirely populated by Duke varsity athletes. She herself had been on the women's tennis team. The other young man who came to uh, meet with me had been on the Duke football team, and the third was a middle distance runner on the Duke track and field team. They had created this program, that had, they had 80 students, they taught students English, they taught them physics, uh, they taught them badminton, they taught them soccer, they taught them basketball, and they taught them some fourth sport, which is unfortunately not occurring to me at the moment. And when I said to them, I mean, you see what's so amazing, this is just a, like, you know, people didn't do this when I was a student. Uh, but now, the idea that this would be an ordinary experience for students to go somewhere where they could use their education to impart education to somewhere else, someone else, they could learn what the world looks like in a place profoundly different from where they came from. And the most interesting thing they said to me was uh, that they said, when we got there, we realized it was our training as athletes that was the most important at, of all because we went to a place where the school system is very much based on rote recitation and memorization, uh, and we wanted to teach people te teamwork, group initiative, things of this sort, and we had learned exercises in the athletic program at Duke to pass that on. Uh, I'm telling you, a place where people take the whole of their education and put it together and take it somewhere and then put it to work in the world toward an end that no teacher of theirs could ever have dreamed up, that's a place that's giving a kind of education. So let me just say, this is Duke today. I now, <laughs> you almost missed that cue now, didn't you? <laughs> I'm not gonna call up Blair, and Blair, why don't you start moseying up and heading toward the chair on the, on the far side, as is your custom. Uh, Blair's a friend of mine, Blair's a friend of many people here. Uh, Blair came to Duke in the early 80s, uh, and he is a total Dukey. Uh, he is the only member of the faculty who I saw at the dedication of the new field hockey field uh, two weeks ago. His wife is a professor of psychology uh, and the faculty athletics representative. His son is, I believe, a junior or something some such, some such year. You came to teach at Fuqua in the early 80s. People in this room had him and knew him as a beloved teacher. But what makes Blair's life interesting is what happened next. Blair quit the faculty of Fuqua. Now, this means he gave up the tenure that attaches to a faculty position, stop and think. He did it because he wanted to see if he could create a program that gave a tailored executive education on a global basis. He founded a program out of thin air called Duke Corporate Education. It has been rated number one in the world by the Financial Times year after year after year. Duke CE has offered education in over 80 countries in something like eight languages uh, and is uh, continually celebrated. When Doug Breeden stepped down and we needed a new dean at the Fuqua School, we ran a search and we had fabulous candidates from everywhere, one of whom was not Blair Shepard. Uh, however, some people said, what if we talked to, you had said you weren't interested. I mean, I hope you don't mind my revealing this fact. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forget I ever said it. Uh, Blair agreed to enter into conversation. The committee and everyone else thought that he was head and shoulders the best candidate, and we were so happy as to persuade you to come aboard. What this means is we have a person who was an academic expert who then became a real world entrepreneur who understood the different business environments of ever so many places around the world who could bring all that experience to the position of dean of our business school. And that's just what we got in you. Uh, we got a few other things that make you suitable for the needs of this moment. 
I say education is going to have a global horizon. Well, last night you slept in Moscow. Uh, and uh, you really have, are in the process of internationalizing our program in a very aggressive way. I say in future the disciplines can't be isolated from each other. One of the most uh, impressive hours I spent with you, Duke hosted a conference on the issue of African health workers. You may know that Africa is supposed to have 24% of the health burden of the world and 3% of the health workers of the world. And the question arises, in a country without uh, many medical schools, how do you train the personnel to do this? Uh, and this is a problem, it's partly a medical problem, but it's partly a leadership and managerial problem, which you saw, and hence you came aboard. And we also learned that in many places in Africa, uh, the manager or effective leader of a community comes from a faith-based organization. And so you, the dean of the Divinity School, and the head of our global health program co-convened this conference. A person who is interested in that kind of idea of business is a person who really has some sense of how to prepare people for a future world of business. So I just want to say, uh, now watch me uh, discreetly uh, mosey toward my chair. I just want to say my great, great warm welcome to Blake. Put her there. <laughs> so, so I keep my job even if this doesn't go well tonight? I didn't say that. All right. <laughs> uh, so, so here's the idea. I'm going to ask Blair some questions, uh, be only because I'm sure they're questions you would like to ask. And then we'll throw the floor open and we'll both answer whatever questions you raise to the best of our ability. Uh, let me just, just, just quickly tell us about the business of leaving the faculty and then the decision to come back to the deanship. Well, well the reason for starting Duke CE was I had um, seen two things that really bothered me. The first was that a number of firms had actually come to depend on people outside the firm to make decisions for themselves and, and give up their own responsibility. And the reason they did is, is that there wasn't someone who could educate them about how to, how to deal with the problem. And so I saw some firms getting hollowed out at the senior leadership level. The other one that was really disturbing to me was that I, I kept bumping into people who had been students of mine who had sort of lost the ability to dream. And, and, and what education does, if it does anything, is sort of reinvigorate the ability to dream. And so for me, the issue was create a proposition on a global scale that could actually continue education for people after they'd finished their terminal degree. Um, it was a phenomenal opportunity to sort of uh, test my entrepreneurial skills and um, actually bring Duke's brand to the world. As you know, I came back somewhat begrudgingly, but I'm delighted. Let's just I say did. reluctantly. I'm, I'm, <laughs> delighted, I'm delighted I did. Um, uh, you're a very good arm twister. And um, it's been phenomenal coming back because, you know, it's sort of, a, it, I get to be an uncle. Sort of, you, I left a place seven years ago, I came back and you sort of see how your nephew or your niece grew up. Duke has really grown up. Okay, well this gives me an opening. Uh, <laughs> what was Duke seven years later after you stepped out? And okay. what's it going to be seven years from now, now that the uncle is home? Oh, that's fascinating. I have, I have no idea about the answer to this. Okay, well, question. okay. First one. Um, you actually outlined it. it, it the parts work together in a way they never had before. Mm -hmm. um, students are much more interested in, in thinking about how what they're learning applies to the problems of the world. Um, we're better, just better, just sort of pure quality better, um, sort of across the board. Faculty are better, the, the place is prettier, um, it's better run. Um, and, and, and so the asset base is way stronger than it was seven years ago. And then I think the final piece is um, Duke has become Duke. It's no longer trying to pretend to be someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you get to help make it. Yes. Right? Uh, and, and I'm positive this is the reason you gave up, begrudgingly or whatever <laughs> word we agreed on. Uh, what do you want to do with the business school? Uh, um, I don't believe that business schools are configured to prepare the leaders the world needs. And, and uh, the reason in part is that... All the that people in the room with MBAs can perk up their ears at this point. Is, is, that, is that we start, we start having a very... I mean, we, we have a tremendously a cosmopolitan business school, but we're parochial, and we're largely parochial because if you come to Durham and you're there for three or four years, you sort of stop being who you were and you become kind of a Durhamite. 
right? You look at the world from a narrow lens. This is true of every business school. It's, it's every right. business school, every business school anywhere in the world. Second thing is that we're disconnected from the rest of the university in ways that are really problematic. And then the third is that um, we're discipline bound, so that if you're a finance professor, you probably know the faculty at other universities better than you know your own faculty in marketing or management. And, and the problem is that the world just doesn't allow that as the structure to prepare students. It, as you, you described it, it's global, it's, it's uh, multidisciplinary, and it's problem-centered in a way where you have to bring all of those things together. The school that I just described is not a school that can prepare that student. So what we have to do is create the school that can do that. And that's what we're here to do. Well, tell me how you're going to start. I mean, you've already started. You're, you're, you're far down the road already. So yeah, we're, I mean, it's, I mean it, we can't go back now. Um, so, so there's sort of two fundamental premises. First is we need to be embedded and connected in the places in the world that are essentially shaping the future. And therefore, you've got to be in China, you've got to be in India, and you know the locations. And the second is we have to do it in a way that, that has other parts of the university doing it with us. So it's really critical that engineering be in India, um, not just, not just Fuqua be in India. It's critical that the School of the Environment be in China, not just Fuqua be in China. So, so what's important in that is that we don't go as Fuqua and then engineering go as engineering. We actually go in a much more integrated way. This is something, just for your information, we've really been trying to do at Duke. Uh, every, every American university is building its international uh, focus. Uh, but Duke's special strength, I believe, is the fact that we really do put the disciplines together there. So we're trying, uh, when we go abroad, to take the combination or the synergy of disciplines rather than just to, uh, to, to take business to one place and medicine to another. Yeah. But of course, Fuqua is famous for the fact that many people come there to study health sector management, for instance, which would yes. seem to be the kind of boundary. Tell me what you think is an easy bridge for business education to build to another discipline, and what's a hard bridge? I think the easy bridge, interestingly, is environment. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's easy because it's so compelling today. It, whenever I'm asked for an example and I'm tired, I give environment because it's an easy one, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it seems unnatural in some ways. I mean, you use divinity, which may seem the most unnatural, but those two have actually been pretty easy. I think the harder ones are the ones that are fairly close, and because they're close, um, there's some tension, right? So engineering's harder than it should be. Law is harder than it should be. We have a global capital market center. Let me give you right. this example. It really, right. it, it, it horrifies me. We created a center six years ago, assuming that the world was going to need someone who understood the structural circumstances that made financial markets work or not work. Right. We knew it six years ago. Right. That center is a bad center because the, the pieces don't work as well as they should. Had we done a better job of connecting them, we would have had the intellectual activity going on between law, policy, and business that would have prepared us to be the sort of leaders in how we deal with the problems of today. Mm -hmm. that, that's an example of where we, we need to do a better job. Okay. Uh, Blair and I uh, were in India together, what, three weeks ago now? Yeah. Seems like yesterday. Yes. Uh, and Blair, I, I don't know if you guys already know this or not, uh, Blair has helped to author a vision of Fuqua in which it would have programs that had presence in China, in Shanghai, in India, in Delhi, in the Middle East, in Dubai, in Russia, in Petersburg, in London, in London, and in <laughs> the United States, in Durham. Uh, to, to, to just tell us a little about the thinking, the thinking of, of that. Well, so, so if you want to prepare a student for the world that is increasingly economically interdependent, and I think it's going to be more so, the, the consequence of this crisis is going to be we're going to be closer together, not further apart. Mm -hmm. um, you actually have to understand the world from a bunch of lenses. Um, what happened during the Cold War is that we sublimated huge civilizational differences. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, the assumption we had was that sort of, you know, the U.S. view of the market economy had won. That isn't what happened, right? What actually happened is a whole series of civilizations that have deep and proud traditions actually reemerged with a slightly different lens. So what we're trying to do is essentially be in those locales in a way where we humbly become them and then connect them to the rest of what Duke is doing. So it's kind of embed and connect. Okay. So as I understand it, as you've explained this to me, the whole point is you want a student to understand that 
well, you said this to me once, and, and you can correct me. You said to me once uh, that however uh, much it presents international case material, American business education tends to be based on a United States model of business itself. Yes. Uh, whereas you say uh, that the interesting problems of business are indeed shared around the global economy, but that doesn't mean they look identically at different places in the global economy. Yes, they change form as they move around the world, right? Okay. You just think about subprime as an example. Okay. Right? You, 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 the, you wake up, any, you, you go to sleep anywhere in the world, and by the time you woke up in the morning, it was a different problem because other actors had acted on it, right? The story that, that is a, uh, one that really struck me was the, was the Dubai Ports Authority deal, reason, sort of failure of that in Congress is part of the reason that the major banks in the U.S. couldn't get sovereign money. Now, yeah, if yeah. you sat in New York, I don't think you could possibly have anticipated that as a problem. If you sit in Dubai, it's obvious. Sp spin this out just a little bit for the layman. All right, so, so here's what happened, right? Um, uh, as several of the big banks um, were in their last throes, they needed capital, right? The place where capital was still available was sovereign funds. Um, one of the banks actually went with the assistant treasurer and uh, number two in the Fed around the world and put a package together which would have been enough money to, to probably survive the run on the bank, right? Um, about 60, 65 billion dollars. The net result is um, sovereign funds would have owned um, well into 30 percent of the bank. The most important investor in that group was the Emir of Dubai. He woke up the next day, saw the total investment that was involved in that, and said, there's no way Congress will let us do it. I'm pulling the money. Because Congress remembered the time that the US government had already approved the Dubai ownership of the ports, and then somehow the plug was pulled on that. They pulled the plug. And they saw the association. We didn't, right? In the US, we didn't see how those two were connected. In their mind, the assumption was, if, if Congress says we can't own, if we can't Dubai own ports in the East Coast of the United States, they're clearly not going to let us own one of the major investment banks in the United States. They didn't own it, but they would have had clear, close to controlling it. So when you gave this example, I really understood something, which is your point is not that the business school of today is likely to end up working in Dubai. It's that wherever the business school of today ends up working, they're going to need to know how all these different multivariate problems come together in every industry they're going to be in. This is a really important point because everyone keeps asking, keeps saying you're building a campus in India. Right? I remember. It's not, I was, it's not, it's not uh, what we're doing, right? What we're trying to do is actually create a legitimately global learning experience. Right. To, to sort of recreate Duke in India just means you've got another parochial site. That's not the objective, right? The objective is actually sort of somehow embed and connect. Well, to create a Duke that's in Durham, but whose students have the mental ability to enter into the exactly. different situations exactly. that their businesses pass through. Exactly. Uh, okay, so you're in business, so I suppose it might be fair to ask you about the current situation. When did you feel you had a sense, a, a proper sense, of the dimensions of what was about to unfold? I still don't think we do have a proper sense of the dimensions that are about to unfold. The good news I can tell you is I put my own um, uh, uh, retirement savings in cash last October. Um, sorry, sorry, I should have uh, actually. Um, Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, All those field hockey games, you've had a million chances. <laughs> it's true. The, the, you know, there's actually a person who teaches real estate finance for us who has been saying to the students graduating for the last three years, don't buy a house. Really? So he knew it three years ago. Okay. I, I don't think anyone has understood the proportion of the problem until recently. What's intriguing is when you leave the U.S., how much of a global problem it now is. I mean, it is everywhere. So, so it is a preoccupation in Russia, it's a preoccupation in China, a preoccupation in India, not just in the U.S. And, and I think the problem is it's, it is still a major credit problem, and it's still a major leverage problem that's working its way out of the market. So we keep pumping money, and everybody says we're going to create inflation. turns out we're not because the money keeps getting used because we're deleveraging the economy. Right. But, but what's a problem now is it's now a psychological problem. People aren't buying anymore. Uh, I'll just tell this audience what you know. When you and I were India, in India, it was around the 10th, 11th, 12th of October. 
and India was not that concerned at that point. Do you exactly. remember? Uh, but one day when we were there, the Indian market dropped 15% in one day. Yes. But even then, people said to us, the Indian economy isn't like the American economy. It's based on internal trading within the country. We don't have the financial dependencies. Now? It's not true. Okay. Uh, I mean, so, so, but you gotta, you gotta put in perspective. So when I was in China, there was this really f interesting, I got to follow a conversation between two economists, one of whom was describing this in terrible doom and gloom and how there's gonna be social unrest and a huge problem, and the other one was saying, actually, things are gonna be great. A member of the audience said, so what's the difference in your forecast? They both said 9%. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so harm in, the, the important point, though, is if it goes below 8% in China, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Because they're producing so many people into the market that they've got to have that kind of growth to keep ahead of people's expectations. Right? Mm -hmm. So a minus 1% or minus 2% for us is actually less harmful than a 6 or 7% in China. And so they're now getting dangerously close to that number. Well, and now I would next want to ask you uh, the proposals we have all watched unfold that the government of this country has adopted uh, how would you assess their adequacy to where we are now? Um, well, th the first piece is, as I said, it shifted from a financial problem to a psychological problem, and what worries me desperately is the lack of consistency in what people are doing. Um, it, it, now, you clearly have to respond to changing circumstances, but, but you're not going to reestablish trust if it feels like your, your game plan is changing again and again and again and again. And so um, a couple pieces that, you know, David Cutcliffe actually has the same offense every day. He changes it a little bit to respond to the, to the opponent, but you know that they're going to have this no huddle offense, right? Part of the problem for me is psychologically we aren't leading in a way that establishes a sense of security and trust um, and psychological well-being and therefore people aren't buying cars. Um, people aren't buying houses, people aren't, they're just not buying, and the, and the danger is that what, become, what was a credit problem becomes a full-blown economic So problem. would it have been better to have stuck with a strategy that you discovered two weeks later wasn't the right one for the sake of the confidence it would induce? It would have been, I'm, I need to be careful how I say this. It would I have love been these interviews. It would have been better to seek counsel wisely before you made your first judgment in a thing that you didn't know all that well what you were doing. Well, because we're all traveling through a situation that no one has been through before and no one knows what the, uh, what the next step of it is. Uh, okay, so say that I were the president-elect. Yes. I mean, I am the president. Uh, and, I, <laughs> uh, and I call you and I say, I need some advice. We have a problem. I've read this piece of yours that says that the trouble isn't the financial instruments, now it's psychological. So how, do, how does a culture or a global culture overcome a crisis of confidence? It's a really great question. So first thing is you have, to t you have to solve the fundamental problem. So somehow you have to solve the mortgage problem, right? You've got to go to the root of it and you have to somehow get it so that people don't lose houses at the rate they're losing houses and you have to get it to the point where people feel like they actually can buy a house again. If you don't solve that problem, which is what started it all, then anything you do isn't gonna work, right? So you gotta go to the core of it. And I think actually the good news is we're moving toward that as an answer, right? So, so, so first piece there still is the fundamental financial issue. And then the second one is that there's a really important issue in terms of how quickly we're deleveraging and how little credit that makes available to the market. I just think people, that we have to solve that problem, right? Um, and so the first advice is get fantastic economic counsel and make decisions, argue it really hard behind closed doors, make the decision and stick to it as much as you can. Okay. Second piece is you have to get people looking forward. That's right. And so there's a lot of ways. I mean, he could take environment as a way to look forward. You could sort of say, we need to innovate a way right. to a new energy world. Right. Something that gets, you know, a man on the moon. We need another man on the moon. Okay. Okay. Well, you use the analogy of David Cutcliffe, and of course, that was the challenge in a different venue that he faced, which yeah. is with the same material, how do you get a different result? Exactly. Uh, well, okay. Uh, so now I'll ask, I'm gonna ask you two questions, and then I'm gonna ask, uh, open it to everybody, which is, uh, and, and you know, just, just glare at me if this isn't an appropriate question. Do, <laughs> 
Do you think business education bears any burden for the evolution of the situation we've been, we're now living in? Unequivocally. Pardon me? Unequivocally. Oh. So, so, so um, <laughs> now I'll have you know <laughs> that we actually decided to sort of uh, a couple of years ago to focus on, when I first came in, sort of focus on uh, firms that we thought were really sort of taking the world in, in a direction we thought was going to be fruitful. And we picked a number of banks, and it turns out we picked all the winners. And we have more Fuqua students in those banks than in the ones that didn't do so well. So, so um, good news at least. This rates right up there with your decision to keep all your money in cash. Um, <laughs> uh, but we still had a bunch in the banks that didn't do so well. I, I think we do a couple things. There's some basic principles of risk management that we've been teaching for years, but somehow we didn't get embedded in the system. right? Um, and, and, and because I think what we did instead was actually teach some other things with greater ingenuity in, uh, in, and, uh, in, a, in a greater sense of verve. So the people who were innovating were actually doing a better job of innovating than the people who were trying to stay up with it on the regulatory side. But, but the principles have been there. Right? Um, so there's simple things like don't allow people to uh, issue debt without holding some of that debt because they'll end up doing, they'll end up selling more than they should sell or sell inappropriate things. Second one is um, we, didn't get people to understand enough about the nature of differential risk. So second order derivative risk is nonlinear. We were applying linear analysis to a nonlinear risk problem and somehow didn't make the connection between those, those two phenomena well enough. And I think, and then the third thing I think is in some ways, and this is heresy for a business school dean to say, we actually believe in our souls that shareholder value is the only thing that matters in business schools, and I think that's wrong. It's the first order of a business, but it's not the only thing that matters. And, and we got that across so devoutly that um, I think it's a part of the problem. Well, maybe you're already answering what will be my final question. Uh, when I interviewed you, I don't think I've ever made this public before, uh, but what, the thing I found most impressive when I interviewed you was your idea that business education is, is about preparing people for business careers, but it's not only about that, because you said to me that every, pro every serious problem in the world needs skills that are taught in business schools uh, to, help, to help solve it. Uh, so you have an extraordinarily broad concept of the mission of education and the mission of universities as uh, bearers of that education. Uh, uh, so here's my question. What's the future business education going to look like that will prepare people to build the world we all want to inhabit together 10 years from now? So the premise, the premise is an important premise, is that um, increasingly it's impossible to disentangle business from other things, okay. right? It, it used to be the case that the periodicity of environment was so long that business could do whatever it wanted and then someone else could worry about the environment problem. Can't do it anymore. You just can't because, so, so if you wanted to isolate business, you couldn't, right? So that therefore says we have to prepare people who are fantastically more multidisciplinary in their perspective than we're now doing, but they have to be really, really, really good at something. So part of the premise is we have to create what feels like paradoxes, right? So people are great members of a team and fantastic leaders when it's their time. People who have deep expertise that can be brought to bear as a member of a collaborative team against a problem, but are sufficient generalists and sufficient globalists so that they can actually see how that expertise fits in. The problem with expertise taught now, even in right. business, is they don't see how it fits. So the finance guys right. don't know how they're part of a business, right? And the business people don't know how they're part of a larger economy, social or political economy. So, and then the final one is you have to turn out people who are unbelievably smart, but able to interact with everybody. Because we need, here's the job that I hope some of our kids take. Someone has to be entrepreneurial, marketing-based, um, gifted project manager, able to invent new business models, and be willing to live in Indonesia. Yeah. That's right in the cocoa trees or in the coral reefs okay. working the problem at its very front end. Right. No one's producing that kid, I want to. Okay, great. Uh, it's fun to be at a university. You get to hang out with people like Blair Shepard. Thanks, Blair. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, I asked a lot of questions, but I probably didn't ask all the questions you might have, and so we'll just now throw it open to questions that anybody has for either Blair or, my, or, 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 or myself. Uh, uh, you, you, sir, and then you, Tori. I wonder if the Duke educational system, which is excellent, could could develop the worst, uh, proper word use of the word. The word is no. The evidence is that nobody in government said no to torture, no to Vietnam, or no to Iraq, no to all the other the uh, the disgraces of our foreign policy in the last eight years, which have lowered our esteem in the world and in the business world. None of the domestic auto uh, management or union people, in contrast to the foreign people said, no, we can't afford these wages, and no, we shouldn't be doing these uh, SUVs. But most important, none of the bank presidents said, no, we should not lend money to people that can't pay their credit cards, can't pay their auto loans, and can't pay their subprime mortgages. Can Duke do something in its own way to um, make the, word, you, the w use of the word no more effective? <laughs> you first, or me? Good for you. Uh, uh, of course, I'm tempted to say that the answer is no. <laughs> instead, instead, I'll say this. You know, people sometimes make the mistake of thinking that uh, universities are the place where you end your education, but we all know they're the place where you begin your education. So universities don't teach you whether to say yes or no. They teach you all kinds of things, and then you go out into the world where you have to try to figure out in what circumstances is yes the right part of the answer, and in what circumstances is no the right part of the answer. You know, every day at Duke, we, you know, if we built every building someone wants us to build at Duke, uh, Duke would reach uh, almost to Washington and Atlanta, uh, and we would be uh, in trillions of dollars of debt. But universities just have to get in the business of saying, we're going to test these ideas, and eventually we'll say yes to some, and eventually we'll have to say later to some, and some we'll just say no to. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your answer specific to business education. It's an, I think it's a great question. So I think there are, there are a couple of things that happen. So to, if, if you take the bank example, part of what occurred is that, is that um, people started making tremendous money and then uh, others in a bank would come along and say, the principles you're applying don't work anymore. Just take a look at what they're doing, right? So, so I think in a sense there's a couple of pieces that are critical in education that will permit people to have greater spine. The first is to actually understand really how they do what they do in a more fundamental sense. Right? So all businesses make money in a very simple way. All businesses have a mission that's a very simple mission. What happens is we, we've taught people to be incredibly innovative and creative around it, but you can forget your core occasionally. So a piece of what we have to do is say, while you're being innovative, remember the constraints on it. Remember sort of, um, remember the fundamentals. And, and I think one of the dangers is specialization teaches people not to understand the fundamentals of the larger system that's, because the right, specialist right. doesn't understand a larger system, right? So, right? so the first answer I would give is President Broadhead's first observation today about what makes Duke special, which is we're trying to turn out people who understand how the whole thing fits together. If you understand how the whole thing fits together, it's easier to understand how you're putting it at risk with a move. That's right. right? That's right. Second one I think is that we need to make sure that we have people connect their values to their education, That's right. not our values, because That's That's right. it's not our job to presuppose. But, but, but remember that actually action is a sort of, in, every action you take is an instantiation of who you are and what you believe. Mm -hmm. right? um, I think we separate that a little bit, or we impose a set of values on them, and it then becomes easier when they're not mine, it becomes easier to ignore. But I'd say the first one's the most important one. If you don't understand how the whole system works, you don't know that you have to say no. Okay. Tori. Thank you so much. I'm just going to go again to my class of Dr. Phil. Uh, Duke has been a pioneer and a world leader in social enterprise, and I know it's something that you take very seriously. Mm -hmm. And as an emerging social entrepreneur myself who's about to launch a, a company, which is a scary endeavor, um, I'm wondering if you think that the current economic crisis is going to squelch um, the spirit of innovation or is really going to bolster it and make it almost essential for where we're heading? Uh, I, um, That's a great question. You, you know, if you take a look at the dot-com bubble, uh, 
some of the greatest IT innovation evolved from that bubble because it was necessary. So Google emerged from that bubble, right? So the whole new view of, of social, social IT emerged from that bubble. Right. And so I think um, from the bus, not from the bubble itself, from the, from the tough times. So I think actually two things occur in difficult times. The first is that quality reveals. And the second is that good innovation succeeds. The, 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 you'll, you'll fail faster, right? Which is a good thing because if you fail faster, you have the chance to learn what was wrong, fix it, and then try it a second time. But if you have the right innovation and you have quality, you'll succeed better here. So just a story, if I may. When Duke C was created, um, a year later, 9-11 happens. All travel stopped for three months. Duke CE was a travel-based business. We had no revenue for three months. But we grew 25% that year. Right? The reason is, I think it was a good idea well executed. Right? And so, Jump in the water. Good. Good. I see a hand back there. I feel like I'm a student of yours out here, and, and all of us are some number of years from our ed educations at Duke. How would you recommend or counsel us to position ourselves, um, both from a simple-minded financial standpoint for those of us who did not have the foresight to get out of the market and liquidate our <laughs> retirement funds um, from that perspective and also from uh, the perspective of being citizens um, and employed citizens hopefully or unemployed citizens who want to be employed how would you recommend we position ourselves for whatever may occur and this may build on your previous comment of innovation and quality mm -hmm. this is for me so it would appear. Wow, that's a good one. Um, so, so a few pieces. You know, in um, some of the firms that did really well in the depression, um, remembered that uh, people mattered. Right. So they did. They did some simple things. Like what was intriguing. There's a steel firm in Canada that actually invented um, sort of distribution of shares to employees um, during the depression because they couldn't pay them. Right, so they increased ownership in the, in the firm with people that said, we can give you enough to survive, but that's all we can pay, right? Um, executives took huge stock, I mean, took, took huge, pay, huge pay cuts, and they created a sort of a, a family that survived that model and became the most thriving steel firm in the world for about 20, 30 years. They forgot that lesson, by the way, right? And, um, and, and so the first piece of advice is, um, remember that it's about the people. Right? Um, banks in 87 who laid off all the new kids and who didn't recruit weren't available to respond when the market ticked up. The banks had actually found a way to somehow continue to recruit and to continue to develop their talent um, really took off disproportionately when we came back out again, right? So the second piece of advice is there will be an end to it, right? And the third is um, someone has to generate optimism. Okay. So someone's got to go try, right? So if we, if we have a right. grad from four years ago who's actually willing to go be a social entrepreneur and is hesitating because it's a tough time, please don't because as I was saying, it is now becoming a psychological problem. So someone has to lead. Right? And um, so if there was a business you always wanted to start, start it now, right? If there was a thing you always wanted to do, do it now. If there's a set of people you always wanted to engage in something, engage them now. Because we need Duke grads to create the optimism that will be essential for us to get out of this. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Please. Financial failures uh, by uh, by the answer they're too big to fail. <laughs> well, obviously they are. Um, so, so you know we had this really interesting premise. We had this really interesting premise, which is if we could bundle enough risk together into a large enough basket, then you would never be at risk to risk. Right now, a couple things happen with that. First thing is when you bundle things together, you separate accountability. You you, you remove accountability. 
Right? When we bundle enough things into a large enough basket, the people who sold it are no longer responsible for what they sold. Right? So you've got to manage that problem, and that's one of the problems of getting big. The second one is when you fail, you really fail, and it hurts. Right? Um, the, the nice thing about sort of large baskets, and, and it takes on some funny qualities. So for example, one of the consequences of the, of the failure of all of the structured products is that people aren't saying those products were wrong, they're saying the banks that sold them were wrong. And the reason is that they actually bought brand. So people bought City, people bought Lehman. They didn't buy the structured product because they were so far from understanding it that the only thing they could buy was the brand. So when the product failed, they destroyed the whole company. Right? And, and so the important point is, if you're gonna make big, 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 big bets, you better manage it because the downside of the big bet is horrendous. Okay. That's great. These have been great questions and I believe great answers. I'm gonna take one more and then Blair and I will both be around afterward. Uh, and uh, I actually see two hands. One, is that a hand? Sir, uh, all the way in the back. Uh, Ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, but he was, he was standing up. My he name is androgynous, so there's lots of confusion. Um, <laughs> I'm Channing Page. I graduated in, from Fuqua in the Millennium class. And I asked Blair this question in private, and now I'll put it to him in public. Um, I left environmental nonprofits to get into environmental business and came to Fuqua to make that transition. And I did it with the conviction that the business world had the human capital and the financial capital, the, sort of the assets, to bring to bear just lots of power to address environmental problems beyond what nonprofits could do, beyond perhaps what government could do. And when I came to Fuqua, I did not find this problem-solving attitude was shared by my, by my classmates as much as I would have hoped. And it was part of the education, and I was, I was fine by that. Um, I mentioned to Blair one of my brightest, brightest classmates um, from Malaysia got tremendous job offers from all the top consulting firms and he got to pick and choose. And he and I would have these debates periodically, which I did not prevail, but the, the question was he believed that these questions of social, environmental, cultural issues were for the you know, school of the environment is for the public policy schools, and as far as he was concerned, if the discounted cash flow analysis with a properly selected discount rate would demonstrate that you could get a net present value from the destruction of a rainforest, then that was the decision to make, and that was business's job to make that decision. And he and I would, you know, go at each other over that, but this never, never came into the classroom, and I'd say that the faculty was nervous to address that kind of tension. So I'll, I'll let you think about that with all of us. So I'm not sure if that's a question or an <laughs> assertion. Um, if you sort of two things in the premise, I think, that are important to highlight that I want to agree with and then try to answer the question behind it. First is that you can't separate business from policy questions anymore. It, you just can't because the the periodicity of the question is so short that they're now business issues. And it turns out we're not going to solve the environment problem through public policy answers primarily. They're, they're critical, but we're going to solve them through business and engineering. Right? I mean, we're going to innovate the answer to environment, for example. We're going to innovate. And, and that's a business issue right? at, at the heart of it. So, so I don't think we can, we can afford to have business sit on the sidelines. And so I agree with that first part of the premise. I think the second part is really important, which is the point I was making about shareholder value, and, and but let me say it differently. If we treated shareholder value the way it was originally, which is shareholders took the money last and therefore everyone else had to be taken care of, maybe it would still be the right premise. We're not thinking of it that way anymore. The critical issue is that there are things we teach in business schools that actually allow us to do NPV the wrong way. So for example, we treat environmental degradation as something that has no cost. It's just not true. You know, we consider it a public good that's infinitely large. It isn't, right? So, so the accounting's wrong, right? Um, or the economic models are wrong, or, or one of the groups is doing the wrong kind of assumption. So therefore, I think it's two things that are incumbent upon us as a business school. The first is every discipline has to ask itself, are our assumptions still right? And I think we're gonna see 
that in some very important ways they're not. And second, we're going to have to bring that into the classroom. Now, a thing I want to highlight, the critical point in that assertion for me is that business is the answer. I don't want to take business out of business schools. Right. I don't want us to become a policy school. Right. I don't want us to become an environment school. We are a business school, and therefore we've got to teach the fundamentals of business right. We just have to realize that many of the ways we taught it have fallacious assumptions. And it's got to be smack in the middle of the classroom. That's great. Uh, that's a pretty good place to end up. Uh, I see there are more questions, but you'll have a, a crack at Blair as long as you like. Uh, let me thank you for being a great classroom full of students uh, and you for being a great teacher. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.